Hey there, I'm Colleen Taylor. We're backstage live at TechCrunch Disrupt, New York City 2013, and sitting with me fresh off stage from talking to Michael Arrington and David Karp is Rolla Falka from Sequoia Capital. Nice to join you. Thanks for joining us. And if any of you out there watching right now, we're in a break. Uh, so if you have any questions for Roloff, tweet at us with the hashtag TC Disrupt, and we'll try to get to them. But I certainly have some questions for you as well. Now, you talked on stage a bit about companies staying private for a long time, and it sounds like you and Sequoia are happy with that. You're, you're happy that companies can build privately before going public. Yes. And I know that you know at your firm, I think you have something like a dozen companies with valuations of over a billion dollars who are still private, right, in your portfolio. So why is that okay to you guys? The reason it's okay is we, our passion is being involved as business partners with entrepreneurs to build enduring businesses. And so for us, the, an exit event of, uh, of an IPO is really just a milestone along the way. And which we'd much rather keep our eye on the prize of what, what can we build 10 years from now? Not can we get to an exit in two years, cash out and move on? Mm -hmm. And part of that, to be honest, is informed by our history of the winners surprising you on the upside. So I think, you know, with due respect, I don't think YouTube, we thought it would be as big as it has turned out to be when we initially invested. I think the same is true for our initial investment in Cisco, Electronic Arts, Yahoo, Google, all these companies that have ended up being wonderful, enormous, enduring businesses. They're, they obviously evolved a lot along the way, but they've completely surprised us on the upside. And so that informs a lot of our decision to want to go along whenever possible. And a lot of venture capital firms think completely differently. I know that Kleiner Perkins, Chi Shen, who you're going to be on stage with this afternoon, uh, he told me that he wants to see more companies going out as mm -hmm. IPO candidates earlier. He thinks that too many companies are waiting too long uh, right now. So that's definitely, do you yeah. ever have any arguments with, <laughs> with your fellow venture capitalists about that? We do. Um, and I think, and I don't know what the Kleiner situation is, and so I don't want to argue with him specifically on that issue necessarily, <laughs> but um, the luxury that we have with Sequoia is because we've been around for a while and we have good returns, our limited partners are not clamoring for us to send them distributions. Mm -hmm. We don't have to get distributions out so that we can go raise our next fund. We, we've got enough credibility with our limited partners that we can be patient. Uh, and I think that patience has paid off in, in many of the companies we've been involved with. So, so I disagree a little bit in the sense that um, there are a lot of advantages from staying private and staying focused on building your business rather than being distracted by the need to manage the street and manage all the analysts and investors. It's just a massive distraction for the management team and that comes at the expense of something and it's probably how well they run their business. Do you think that we'll have any companies that never go public? I mean, I'm, this happens all the time that there are companies that stay private forever, but do you think that we're going to have more venture back companies that stay private and you know get returns for their investors in other ways? It's possible, but I don't think that would become predominant. And, and part of that is that many of the companies that have stayed private for a long time have very tightly, tightly held ownership. And so it may be family-run businesses sort of being a quintessential example where people run it essentially for cash. Right. Um, and the way that technology companies tend to be structured, you have a broad investor base and a broad employee base. So you have many different shareholders. And so I think there is an expectation of a liquidity event at some point where people are able to sell their shares or transact their shares. And so right. I don't quite see that happening. Well, although we have Second Market and we have, I mean, Evernote has provided liquidity events for their staffers and their you know, executives without going public quite yet. But it hasn't been that big liquidity event. No, it's not big. I mean, and a lot of people write about it these days. We did a liquidity event at PayPal in 2001. Mm. You know, people think it's sort of a new thing. It's actually been around for a long time. And I encourage it because I saw the behavior for us at PayPal, having done that secondary in 2001, when we started to re receive acquisition offers that, in our opinion, didn't value the company appropriately, we had the nerve to say no. And when you're an entrepreneur and a management team, you have all your eggs in one basket, it's very, very hard to resist the temptation to sell. Right. So. And I want to talk a little bit about PayPal because you're part of that famous PayPal mafia, this group of super uh, smart people who were at this company when they were young, you know, very successful and have still gone on to do very interesting things here 15, almost 15 years later. Um, is there another company or another group of people right now that you see as taking that mantle of being the new PayPal mafia of the 
2010s? I think it's PayPal had a little bit of an unfair um, advantage in the way that that mafia came together because of the acquisition leading to to departures and sort of a bunch of people had a little bit of experience. Unfortunately, PayPal raised way too much money, and so the people who were involved didn't make that much. And so, but they'd all done a little bit, and they were still young and hungry. Um, and so, it sticks in people's memory that these ex-PayPal people did stuff. The, the truth is, that's the history in Silicon Valley. You know, so many companies have been spawned by, you know, the person who worked at Cisco and then did something else. So, if you, if you go back to some of Sequoia's history, um, Apple came from Atari. Sort of part of the inspiration for Apple was a result of Atari. And then Trip Hawkins, who started Electronic Arts, had worked at Apple. And so his vision for Atari and seeing the opportunity in the games industry came from his time at Apple. So there are three companies in Sequoia's history where Atari spawned Apple, Apple spawned EA. So it's happened for a very long time and it'll continue to happen. It's happening from Google, it's happening from Facebook, it'll happen from I don't know, companies like Twitter and, and so on down the road. Um, it may just not be as precipitous as it was with PayPal. So it may not be as noticeable. Right. But it'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> because all these companies are working really hard to keep that talent. They don't want a big exodus like you all had at that time, yes. I suppose. Um, but great. Well, we have to wrap here soon because you've sure. got to get back on stage. Yes. <laughs> you are judging the startup battlefield, and I think it's a great group of companies. Is there any one tip that you would give to those companies that are pitching and want to take that Disrupt Cup home? Clearly articulate your value proposition. Okay. <laughs> Be clear, articulate your value proposition. I've got a note that says, we're going to review Battlefield companies just ahead. We'll be talking about all those seven finalists. So stay tuned here at TechCrunch Disrupt Livestream.